Everything okay? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no. No, for some reason, I thought there was a laptop here. Uh, no, no, I think okay. you can. You had it you just had a memory stick, right? I put it on the computer already. Okay, you're all, so it's all set to go. You're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry.
Everybody, welcome to Grand Rounds. Thanks for coming. Um, hope you all got a bite there to eat. The sandwich is available, as you can see. I'm not sure if we have anybody else on online. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi. We're just going to start Grand Rounds. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. Hope you all got a bite to eat there. I'm really uh, proud to uh, introduce Dr. Kayla, Ken Kayla, uh, one of our cardiologists and intensivists here, and he's getting very interesting stuff here on ultrasound, the uh, the latest on uh, critical care ultrasound. So without further ado, Ken. Thank you. Can everyone hear me from this mic? I have a little bit of a cold, so. Um, so this is a follow-up. About a year, year and a half ago, we did a talk about fluid responsiveness and the use of cardiac ultrasound. So it's going <clears> to <throat> touch a little bit about that, but the, the outline of this is mainly to focus a little bit on more of the evidence of point-of-care ultrasound, how it can change care, use lung ultrasound as an example of the technical things we can do and also how good it is, and uh, then look at some other ways we can use point-of-care ultrasound, and then finally just look at some implementation issues because we have to be practical. This is, you know, anytime you get... Um, new technology, you kind of see everyone will get the new iPhone, everyone's using it in different ways. We've got, you know, CST coming. Everyone's going to be using these tools differently. So is there ways that we could be standardizing how we're using these tools to make them effective? So the background of point-of-care ultrasound is that it's supposed to be linked to a question. It's supposed to help you improve an outcome. It's supposed to be easy to use, easily learned, and um, so we'll try to go through some of the evidence and the practical stuff to see if we can convince ourselves that, you know, point-of-care ultrasound I is there. And then last one, hopefully I don't have to convince you that it's at the bedside. So this was, you know, starting back when I um, was in cardiology training, point-of-care ultrasound was, was starting. And, you know, you always have a, a set response of people. People have a distribution of this is the best thing, this is the only thing we should be using and then some people that are very hesitant. So I actually put the same quote up about, um, uh, this actually is about when the stethoscope came out. So someone wrote that, you know, it's, it's going to give too much trouble. It's probably going to go nowhere. Um, but, but uh, and then so this is their full quote where they said, you know, maybe it's going to be a good discovery, but it seems a bit crazy that you're just going to listen to the patient's chest and it's going to whisper the diseases into you. So it's just interesting to say, you know, anything new that comes out, everyone's going to have a different reaction, right? Um, and so when you look at, like, adoption of technology, you get kind of early, you get the innovators and early adapters, and then depending on the trajectory of the technology, there's a chasm. And so then there's a progression of early adopters to early majority, and then um, late majority, and then laggards, people that will kind of not, not adopt it. So same for the cell phone strategy, people that you don't want to stick to either no cell phone or flip phone. Um, but this is a bit more about customers. So I think, you know, if I think about point-of-care ultrasound, it's in very different stages depending on the location. But I like to think, you know, based on reviewing this evidence that we're going to see, that we're, we're probably pretty close to the early majority. And you see this kind of used in a lot of areas. So thinking about kind of ultrasound, you know, everyone says, oh, it's, it's very helpful. And keep in mind, there's, there's some studies about the use of ultrasound. And when, you're go when we're going through this data, try to think about other technology that you use kind of day-to-day, -day, CT scans, other tests that you order. What level of, um, what standard are they held to before we adopt them? And we get this a lot, you know, sometimes anesthetic or ICU people come, we have this new monitor. It's going to be very helpful to let you know how you can watch cardiac output or you know, and it works. It works when people are very stable, but does it work when people get sick? Because so many things go on when someone's sick. Is a technology where you're going to take 15, 20 minutes, you're going to buy an ultrasound, actually helpful? And so this is um, a Venezuelan study where they used ultrasound, just 80 patients. They said, we're going to do a 
a standard technique where we're going to use ultrasound and see if we're going to find any new diagnosis, are we going to change our management, are, um, are we going to find findings that we didn't know before, and is it going to be helpful? So pretty small study, and they did it in parallel ICUs. So they went and looked at quite a different areas, and we'll have a scan of some of the data that, that's helpful in these areas. So there's, you know, there's optical um, uh, nerve sheath diameter looking for uh, correlation with ICP. They looked at um, lung score to look at extravascular lung water. They did a plural assessment. They looked at cardiac output and fluid responsiveness. They screened the abdomen. And some more extensive things that um, we may not do routinely, uh, looking at uh, abdominal and renal causes of um, shock. And so the interesting thing they, they kind of classified, they said, you know, they made about 50 changes for about 80 patients. And so what kind of changes are those, you know, did they convert the diagnosis? And that's, that's true. So sometimes they found new diagnosis. Pneumonia, because we know our x-rays, you know, the common admission, um, what I remember from like CTU days is pneumonia, heart failure, maybe COPD exacerbation, probably a component of one setting off the other. And so I think knowing how x-ray is, uh, they found they were able to reclassify, you know, finding new pleural fusions, finding pneumothorax, finding pericardial fusion, and this has happened to me. You find someone very hypotensive, and they have no reason for a pericardial effusion. Do the ultrasound, they have a huge pericardial effusion. Um, they change the diagnosis, biliary sepsis instead of pneumonia as the cause. Um, people getting fluids, diuretics, uh, changing dibutamine, uh, and then they also help for procedures. So that's good, they can, you know, but this is a bit of a soft endpoint. If you say, oh, I learned something new, that's helpful but did it change the person's uh, outcome or resource utilization? So just with a small study of 80 patients, they saw that they're using less chest x-rays, um, less request of ultrasound outside of the ICU, um, less CT scans, less stays on the ventilator, and uh, less stay in the ICU. Um, and, you know, small study, so no difference in, in mortality. But I would say those things are pretty impressive, and what other thing do you use on a day-to-day -day basis that could give you um, these, kind of, these kind of results. So I think we're on the track that there's probably some things that are very helpful related to point-of-care ultrasound if we use it properly. The other things they saw, obviously less fluid administration when they're um, using ultrasound. And then just kind of more uh, locally, we also looked at this, uh, this is before I started, but the use of limited echo um, to guide fluid management in patients that are sick. And um, so this found we, it was pre and post impl implementation of using limited uh, echo. And a lot of findings there, but kind of echoes the same stuff that we saw in the first paper. So uh, less fluid administration, uh, more dibutamine, dibutamine used, uh, better survival. And so this was uh, like a 10% difference in, in survival in, in matched patients and less kidney injury. So mimic some of the previous previous data. So I think um, it's pretty, uh, like, uh, to see such a small study show these findings, to me, is, is uh, impressive. This one is larger than the, than the previous one. And just to put into context, you know, you see a lot of the ICU trials, it's almost uh, easier keeping up because a lot of them are negative. You still learn a lot from the trials, but even with this recent ECMO trial in lung injury, the difference in mortality was similar to what uh, the pre and post study found with ultrasound, not to compare them directly, but this one was like the, the p-value was not significant, but still probably some role of ECMO obviously in, in lung injury, but a lot of the ICU trials show no difference because patients are so sick and complex that it's hard to get a homogeneous solution uh, that's going to apply widely, and I think that's part of why a lot of the sepsis trials are harder to get positive because the same, the two patients with sepsis are not very similar. Um, and then the, just one last one about using some kind of dynamic assessment, either ultrasound for fluid management. This has been associated with this meta-analysis of improved um, survival. Um, so maybe we're a little bit convinced that there is a role. And then last time we did this, we walked through the role of cardiac ultrasound and uh, all the caveats related to using it. So I thought this time we would use uh, lung ultrasound to see if we can apply some of the same things. Because I think dealing with the ICU, that's a big part of heart-lung interaction um, and heart-lung diseases that uh, we help support. So 
long ultrasound is nice, and the, a lot of the papers we will go, be going through come from Dr. Lichtenstein in Paris. Um, and it's attractive as a modality uh, because it's mainly based on artifact and patterns. So ultrasound, something full of air, doesn't seem like a really good idea initially. Uh, but that's why part of one of the things that's made uh, lung ultrasound helpful. So just walking through the different notations and if you see some of our lung ultrasound uh, reports, um, where we where you check. So there's different protocols and everyone, depending on if it's done for acute respiratory failure, shock, cardiac arrest, they have different names. For lung uh, ultrasound, one, one of the main ones is called the blue protocol and they have three points. So you put your hands on the patient's chest, the two kind of bullseyes show you the front points, and then you walk back to the posterior axillary line to get this um, posterior, posterior lateral alveolar pleural syndrome point. And that's one where your highest yield is because it's in the back where most of the uh, diseases kind of hang out. Uh, some of the other points, this is just to get some of the notation. Some people do anterior wall, cost, uh, caustic, um, like plural assessment, and then again to the posture wall. So, and then there's a third one. Uh, this is from 2012, where to do lung ultrasound, a four point, uh, four area assessment. So if there's, it's all based on artifact, there's not that many signs to, to learn, and we're just gonna walk through these and see what they can mean. And so the first one is lung sliding. So we just use this um, today patient uh, had an x-ray saying there's a deep sulca sign, possible uh, pneumothorax. And so what lung sliding is, is seeing the uh, visceral and parietal pleural slide against each other. So it looks like kind of shimmering um, pleural line that's moving along, and then you know that there's lung movement at that area. So it's one of the best things to rule out pneumothorax. Just, just like any sign, if the lung's not moving, it can be for lots of reasons. It doesn't just mean that they have a pneumothorax. So that's one of the big caveats of ultrasound or medicine in general. We try to look for these rules, but just they're all not perfect, and we have to understand what could cause the lung to not move. And so this is just a list. You know, you have right main stem intubation, the other side's not moving. Atelectasis, pneumonia, they've been pleurodesed in that area. So knowing the person's history uh, is key to doing the ultrasound. So often we get, you know, it's a new, new tool, and people come very keen to use the ultrasound, but without knowing what you're walking into, it's almost more detrimental, in my mind, to use the ultrasound uh, straight out. So the second sign is A-lines. And so A-lines are an um, artifact. So it's a reverberation artifact, so you get reflections of the pleural line in uh, multiples of itself. Um, and so that's a normal finding without increased lung water. And so what does that mean if you see uh, A-lines throughout? That means that there's not a lot of lung water. In the, in the patient. So it's helpful in some resuscitation early of patients that their lungs are clear. But if you do it on days later, it's not as helpful. And because just like when you walk into the room and someone has peripheral edema, you know that they have a, a extravascular water. So whether it's in their lung, in their legs, um, doing the ultrasound at that point is less helpful. So sometimes you see people, oh, they have beeline, so that means they have high pressure pulmonary edema. But looking at these negative predictive values, we know edema can happen for lots of reasons. So knowing that A lines is helpful, but B lines could tell you that there's a wide spectrum of filling pressures. So we have to understand that when we're looking at um, these A lines. And B lines, they give you basically rockets down of extravascular lung water. So you can get the more water you have, the more lines you have. And so basically you can see a few in like the bottom parts of people's lungs and healthy people, but if you have them throughout, then that's consistent with lots of extravascular lung water. And so what makes a real line? So it has to start from the pleural, has to reflect down, and it moves with your lung. And so usually they're well-defined. They're, um, they erase the A-line pattern, and you just see these, uh, these B-lines. There's different kinds uh, of B-lines. So if you have lots of them, they kind of go to called ground glass versus uh, lung rockets. But, you know, it's just... It makes sense that the more, more edema there is, the more lines there is. So this is just a picture highlighting on the, the first one on the, on the left is uh, beeline, ground glass in the middle. And then the third one is one that can sometimes fool you called Z lines where you still have your A line pattern and the lines just look really not defined and they're not going very down. 
so is this pre feasible? Like we have to compare ourselves to send a person down for a CT scan or X-ray, and you know, if if you have enough <laughs> practice with this, and we see in some other studies, like this can be taught. It's not just like everything else. You have to learn how to read a chest X-ray. You have to learn how to use these tools, but it's very sensitive and specific for diagnosing interstitial uh, syndrome. Whether that's pulmonary edema that's cardiogenic or non, or pulmonary fibrosis, you're going to need some additional stuff from the history to see. Um, but, but it's very feasible to do. Um, so usually you can use this kind of clinically, whether they're going to, some, some of the protocols I'll show you after, basically they resuscitate till they start seeing beeline development, because that's when you're starting to leak interstitially. One, one tool that you may use. Other things that you can see is M mode. So that's when um, just looking in one plane of what's happening with your lung. Normally your lung's moving in and out, and you see this seashore um, setup where the sea is, is your muscle, and, um, and then your lung moves in and out, causing the shore sign. You can get the, if you get transmission of your pulse, called the lung pulse from your heart, you can see that that means that your lung is inter intact and it's sending that pulse across and you can pick it up with the ultrasound. And that's preserved in people that have uh, atelectasis. So you have lung pulse, but then you don't have any sliding because you have atelectasis. Um, you can see transition of this like uh, seashore sign to a pneumothorax area. So you can see um, that lung pulse and the seashore sign ending, then you can tell how big a pneumothorax is. That takes a little more skill, and I think, you know, you have to, we haven't used this as often. Like, if I see some of pneumothorax, it's more to help kind of see if you can quantify it. But um, at that point, you probably can also augment with, with an x-ray. Um, so this is where you see that transition, the seashore, and then you have this barcode sign where the lung's not, not moving. And so it's very feasible. It's very sensitive, or sorry, it's very specific that uh, you have a pneumothorax at that area. But just because of technically, it's a little less uh, in its sensitivity. Um, you know, you, there's obviously caveats. You don't want to go, if you go clo too close to the sternum, the liver can send a pulse out, and you may falsely kind of think that there is a pneumothorax. So again, just going back, how good is this? And so pretty big uh, meta-analysis using lung ultrasound, how uh, sensitive and specific it is. And I think there's no arguing that using lung ultrasound is very specific to um, finding pneumothorax. And it's more sensitive than x-ray because it can probably pick up or it can pick up smaller uh, pneumothoraces. So we'll use this you know, sometimes right after you put a central line if you're concerned. You might scan down to the lung, look, oh, lung sliding's absent, pressure's dropping. That might augment um, putting in a chest tube before, like a, before an x-ray. So I think um, you will pick up smaller ones. And uh, it's interesting because I always look after when you correlate it to the CT scan, you can see these smaller ones. But often on the x-ray, especially when they're supine, this deep sulcus sign is very harder to, uh, to appreciate. The other areas in uh, looking at, at lung ultrasound, we often look at uh, pleural effusions. So, you know, I think we can all, like I've seen a lot of people do lung ultrasound with, with trainees when they go up to outreach or when patients come in. I think people are pretty good at finding pleural effusions, but there's probably a few more details that we want to be aware of. So how big is this pleural effusion? I think grading of it is a bit harder, like uh, the x-rays uh, will say kind of mild, moderate, severe, but for us it's a little less, I think, exact uh, depending on, on who you talk to. And I think one of the helpful things I found is measuring the size of the pleural effusion. So in millimeters, if you multiply it by 20, that's a good estimate of the amount of fluid that's in there. So I think, you know, when you're thinking about draining you're going to look at the distance between uh, the size of the pleural effusion, kind of in, in this next slide, with respiration. How big is it? Usually you want about 15 millimeters before you're going to think about draining it. But also the other helpful thing is estimating the amount of fluid in there. So we can all, I think most people can find them when we're doing these ultrasounds. Um, but, but two, are you going to see how the lung's moving? If it's an area that doesn't have a lot of atelectasis, when they breathe out, the lung's pretty, coming pretty close to, to the chest wall. That might not be one that uh, is going to be helpful or safe to, to tap. That's very different than, you know, you see this compressive atelectasis with associated effusion, this little wavy um, part of the lung that's compressed down by, by fluid. 
And so the other ways, other things that we want to think about when you see lung ultrasound is consolidation. And so there's two ways that you can tell if uh, ultrasound will find consolidation. One is the easy one where it hep has hepatization. It looks like the liver. So it looks like a liver and then a second liver. Often when they come to the IC, they may have more larger pneumonias than they would have when they're on uh, CTU. And so I think one of the other helpful is the transition of abnormal lung to, to normal lung. And the, the next thing I'm going to show you is just this little play. So just like you can get, you can click. So you can get air bronchograms on an X-ray. You can get air bronchograms in ultrasound. And so the one with the three lines there shows these uh, outlines of the. Well, I don't think it's going to play, but uh, shows the signs of your air bronchograms that are not moving. And then this dynamic one, you can find lots of pictures on on the internet, and that's where I took this one from. Um, you can see air movement in the, in the bronchioles, and so consistent with alveolar consolidation, but movement in the, in the bronchi. So that's, if you find that, then, you're, then you know that this is consistent with, with pneumonia. And so these are the two signs that we're talking about. This one on the left looks like a liver with another liver on top of it. That's easy to diagnose as a consolidation. And then the one uh, on the right shows consolidation. So on the outside, kind of normal lung, and then this uh, uh, part of your lobe being consolidated by, by pneumonia. And so again, when using uh, CT as your gold standard, finding uh, and diagnosing consolidation is very good. 90% uh, sensitive, 98% specific, when you use kind of a detailed approach looking throughout the lung. If you look at one area and um, it's not very clear that there's a pneumonia, but you know, it's probably save a lot of people from going from CT, help confirm your diagnosis. And I think you know, these are all kind of done in places that do a lot of ultrasound that have validated against CT. And I think uh, at the beginning part, it's important to try to correlate it with people that have had the CT, but eventually you may use this more and more without, you know, transport is risky for critically ill patients. And uh, this can really augment uh, your treatment. ARDS, you know, once you start getting uh, interstitial edema, it's a little harder to tease out, and you could just tell that there's extra lung water, but there are different patterns where, you know, in ARDS, you may have relative sparing of areas versus pulmonary edema, where it's more, more kind of diffuse. And uh, in, a, in pneumonias, you could have some abnormal kind of thickening of your, your pleura and less sliding. So those are a little bit softer, and I think, you know, with ARDS, we use more of the ventilation, the X-ray changes, and uh, the management of it. So I think this is growing, but uh, you can't expect everything. I think uh, there are some limits of ultrasound. So just going back, reminding everybody about the blue points. So then you can kind of use protocols for looking at, help, help you get into a category, what's the most likely diagnosis. So this kind of uses the two profiles that we just went over, along with a prime sign. So that's if you have sliding or not. Um, and then C is the easy one if you just saw a consolidation. So if you kind of go down, um, looking at lung sliding, so I will go over the whole algorithm, but it kind of makes sense that see B line profile everywhere, it's consistent with pulmonary edema, so lungs are clear, but they have lots of respiratory distress, and you might look to, uh, uh, for PE. If you see a pneumonia, fairly easy. If you see kind of A lines, um, but no lung point, then you probably need to work up uh, pneumothorax earlier um, with some other modalities. So the way these, you know, one of the other tenets, remember, of point-of-care ultrasound is to be relatively quick and help facilitate you getting to the next step. So a lot of them have been set up with the idea of, uh, like, 90%, like, helping you find the diagnosis, help clarify the people you need, and then streamline the ones that you think do need the CT scan or that need, um, like, a full echo to assess for valve disease. And I think... Um, that's a good tenet because that's part of how point-of-care ultrasound is meant to be used. Other ways, uh, this is the other protocol I was talking about earlier. You can, these are pretty detailed and you want to use them as you see fit kind of clinically, but this falls is resuscitating until you see um, changes in their pattern in, the, in their lungs. And it involves first looking at the heart and then looking at their lungs for beeline pattern, ruling out uh, volume status, 
and then treating as more likely distributive shock. Just a couple of reminders from our time last time was just the, the background of you know fluid responsiveness and importance of giving fluid in the ICU. And so before it was it was thought that you know if you're in the CCU you get diuresis very aggressively, in the ICU you get more fluid, but that's changed for many, many years that it's basically you need to give fluid when it's needed. It's going to augment someone's cardiac output, but there's a lot of detrimental um, side effects of it. What complicates it is, you know, when people are on positive pressure ventilation, how their IVC is changing is, is uh, very dependent on how they're breathing, how big their breath is, the type of ventilation. And so I think this is, you know, we won't redo the talk from last time, but one of the biggest caveats is what's the person's physiology that can explain what their IVC looks like. They have big compartment syndrome. Sometimes you have or big, lots of uh, fluid in their belly, and people come. Their IVC is really small, but their belly is really tense, and they have tense ascites. That's kind of how their IVC is supposed to look physiologically. And so you can't make much, um, you can't gain as much information until you know what else is going on with them clinically. So it's much easier, or it's harder when someone's on a support mode of ventilation or spontaneously breathing. The responsive studies are not as good. Um, so there's a range of anywhere from 30, 40 percent of collapse of your IVC, may, uh, showing that the person may be volume kind of responsive. The easier one is uh, distensibility. When someone's controlled, they're taking a controlled breath. You see their IVC get bigger with a breath, and um, you have good numbers of 12 and 18 percent. Someone's going to respond to fluid. The issue is with keeping, uh, with, we keep patients more awake, try to wean them from the ventilator. More people fall into the first support mode category, but this is still helpful um, in the patients that are on a control mode. This also has a protocol. I think you know we have we haven't used this as much. We will take ultrasound to cardiac arrest, and I think uh, the biggest thing we've learned is that oh, the use of ultrasound is associated with less time on the chest and less time of CPR. And so, one of the things to address that this Sesame protocol was set up to start from the outside, look at the lungs, look for pneumothorax, uh, look down, look at their legs for a sign of a big DVT, belly, and then uh, to their heart. So I think they try to be practical, but I think you have to be really mindful of how you're using this in a cardiac arrest, like a person's like, pause CPR, I need to take a good picture of the heart. That's the times that you have to be really aware, or you know, the other times that I've seen this is you're, you're in the cath lab and someone wants to do the PCI, but there's no CPR going to restart the heart after the getting, getting blood flow. So I think um, these are uh, tools, but still need to be very mindful of how you're going to implement them in, uh, in, an, in a cardiac arrest. Some increasing uh, interest was using like TE in cardiac arrest. And so I know, um, you know, I, I think, again, this has to be um, still more clarified. I know the um, emergency team was, was looking into this and whether they, they want to pursue this further. But I think, again, uh, you want to be able to do this right and for the right reasons. And so people, the, the pro side is that doing CPR, people with cardiomyopathies, you may not see the heart compressing and moving CPR may be better. But I would say, for the most part, using end title as a good marker of your quality of CPR is a better and a real-time feedback of, of your CPR. Um, you know, view is, uh, is one consideration, but I think, you know, in pulse check, a short look is also feasible. Um, and then, you know, some may change your, you might find a diagnosis, like uh, dissection or a clot. Those are thoughtful, but I think uh, the T role has to be still more clarified before um, we should be using it widespread, if we should be. Uh, some of the other ones that I just want to show you was, um, you know, this nerve sheath diameter, looking at, uh, so this is a nice study. You look at, uh, over someone's eye, look at their nerve sheath diameter, three millimeters back from, um, where, from, from their globe. And so they did this pre and post study after they did LPs on people and correlated to their um, uh, size of their, of their sheath. And they found good correlation of the shrinking of the nerve sheath diameter, and there's some data about from CT scans correlating to um, uh, using it for high ICP. And so I think 
sometimes we'll use this um, like post post stroke. We had some meningitis cases, but um, you have to kind of tape their eye closed and put some gel on top. Um, other kind of like less glamorous ways, you know, we had one yesterday. Someone had tugged on their foley, and uh, and uh, we looked, and there was less urine output over the next couple of hours. So is that foley blocked? Is there still um, urine in their bladder? So we just looked quickly, and it kind of had a similar picture to this, that the bladder was more distended, and uh, the foley balloon was still in, but so it was likely blocked, and so we changed the foley. You could say you could do a bladder scan, but, you know, when people have ascites, uh, those can misread for, for lots of reasons. So I think... Um, as you're doing uh, ultrasound for, the, for heart and lung, you can find a lot of other things. And I think if there's an issue that you can solve pretty quickly, uh, that's a good use of ultrasound. Some role of using it in um, DVT. Most of them will have two points where you look at um, the femoral vein and the popliteal. I think it's uh, from here, like a good screening factor, you know, very high sensitivity and specificity. But again, people that have do this more comprehensively, and then this one was compared to uh, ultrasound, um, like a formal ultrasound. So I think, you know, this one I use a little less of, but if someone's really unwell, it's, I think, a good screening test. With that, um, one of the other things I kind of want to talk about, and it's good for discussion, is like, how do we uh, apply this, and how do we use it for, um, uh, in the future? So one of the big things that, big concerns are, what is this? You know, is this an extension of your physical exam where you kind of write a note? Um, is it a diagnostic level imaging test that has, has different standards and reporting? And I think, you know, it's probably somewhere in between, but one of the big things is uh, it should be archived or documented in a well manner. So often, often, We'll get, uh, oh, their heart looked like this, um, but we don't know what it looked like previously, and then we look very soon after, and it looks very different. So is that an acute change in their cardiac function? Is it, you know, a different window? Did someone mistake the IVC for the aorta? And I think, you know, for quality kind of assurance and documentation, we have to have some way to archive and, and, and document this and keep getting better because the places that have shown good studies about this have continued to get better and validate themselves. And so we want to be part of the early adopter group, but we want to be part of it in a way that's uh, safe and, uh, and uh, documented. Other kind of practical things, you know, this is a little bit um, from a couple years ago where, you know, comparison of like a big machine versus the point of care ultrasound. Um, the difference in, in pictures, and so I would say, you know, it's, it's mostly or a big part is the uh, person doing the ultrasound. Second, a huge part is the patient's condition. They have pre-cisternotomy, they have COPD, harder to get windows. And then the third thing is probably the machine. Um, and that's probably also because of the big advances recently with these, the, this technology. You can get these probes that are connected to, to your phone, handheld um, devices. I think are close, but if you want to look at Dopplers and other things, um, the bigger machine definitely has advantages and um, is a little easier to upload and, uh, and uh, store. So how we've kind of taken this to implement, so if, if we're ultrasounding patients in the ICU and giving some idea of what we would um, recommend, we look at the patient's baseline history, uh, their uh, function of their heart, in a setting with an idea of what's causing their shock, what their lungs look like, and what we would plan to do with their treatment of shock. Is this mainly vasodilatory? Continue with your pressors. Don't give them more fluid. Actually try to take off fluid because they have lots of lung water as they tolerate it with um, um, monitoring their pressors. And so I think this kind of ties together. This is what we try to do. Um, like I think this is a, a great use of when you're doing it from an ICU, you're using it, you're documenting it, and you're giving kind of, you're, you're planning what you're gonna, how you're gonna treat the patient, then you can reassess. And, um, and so, you know, with that, I just want to show a little bit about how I kind of see this going forward and, get, and getting better and 
kind of take us back to have some discussion, but also just a quick summary, I think. I think hopefully I convinced you some of the initial things of what point of care ultrasound is supposed to be. It's supposed to be versatile, it's supposed to help you with outcomes and something useful, and it's a good investment of, of your time, and that you can learn these things, they can be performed, but there are kind of uh, implementation uh, issues that have to be kind of addressed machines, how are you going to document this, how are you going to keep getting better, what are the relationships um, with uh, over-reading or getting um, overlap from different departments. Um, those are all things I think, like most things, it's all, all about the practical and uh, implementation considerations and, and kind of how we thought about it in, in, uh, in our ICU here. And so I thought with that, just highlighting using it as like a right tool for the right, uh, right problem. Um, so I'll just see if there's any questions about uh, what, what else we could be doing or questions about, about using ultrasound. Are they available? Because when I went to a conference last year, they were coming, and they said to sign up for our wait list. I don't think it's in Canada yet. And so one of the other issues is just the practical thing of um, connecting with like diagnostic imaging, servicing it, um, getting it uploaded in, into the system. So I think if you want to use it in an extension of physical exam, I think the quality was very good. Um, it's helpful, and I think it does I've seen over and over help uh, help get you to the next step. I think it's helpful. I use it. I use our machines that we have in the ICU, and I think the quality is very good. It's um, butterfly. It's just a little bit lacking of plugging it into our, our system. Chris? It was a great talk. I enjoyed it. Um, and a couple of things. One is reading reports that people are making. Uh, I think people need to so all the mild to moderate, moderate to severe, really that means not mild. Um, you know. So I think as a learning thing, you need to commit. And if you commit, then you can learn and be, you know, not being wrong and being having, you know, your answer and compass the world is, <laughs> is, yeah. is not a great uh, thing. So that's the first problem. The second one is you're collaborating with. Those people, and I think that this stuff is wide open for AI. And you know, they've done a fantastic job working on handheld EF AI, and I think they, they have a very good application. And so much of this stuff is, to me, particularly the lung stuff, completely non-intuitive to start out with, which means, which is where I, AI really works. When you don't have the answer in your head ahead of time to what to look for, to say we have a whole pile of people that we can, and immediately did a DT. That's gold for an AI researcher. Right? If you have a gold standard interpretation and you have a bunch of well archived raw images, and you know I think that's wide open for for anything. Uh, I think would be a fruitful area for research. Yeah, I think that's. Uh... That's a great point because I think <clears throat> a large part of this is the yes, helpful, but it's like the context of their lungs, everything else. So I think they want um, three of them like they focused on the the LV function part, but I think it's probably ready to take it to the next step. So yeah, for sure, but you know I'm talking about everything. I'm yeah. About the lung ones, the LV ones, whatever it is you want to do, um, the algorithms that have been developed in data. Yeah. But I think not that much has been done to say, what do the data tell us? I mean, you know, here we have a gold standard. Now just let new signs emerge from yeah. what comes out of it. I think that's a big part of this archiving, and we have the, the data. And like, uh, yeah. I'll definitely talk with them. Well, it's that guy. Um, he's the research chair. He's a very good guy. They gave rounds, I think, um, last year. <laughs> interesting. I don't know anything about it, so it's going to be a naive question, but it would seem to me in critical care often it's tough to make a diagnosis using x-rays, using MRI. We don't get that often. CT, we don't get that often. So it seems like if you're doing studies of a new technology like ultrasound, that's kind of your new variable, 
you comment in the studies how well that's been done? Because the, the risk is you get into this circular, circular argument, uh, which is self-perpetuating, that well, it must be a pneumothorax because I think it's a pneumothorax, versus a blinded observer reading the x-ray, calling that, like Chris said, definite pneumothorax, and a blinded observer reading the ultrasound. And committing and saying definite pneumothorax, and then seeing yeah. how they relate. <clears throat> I think some of them, um, they have varying degrees of how blinded they were. Mm. Some of the ones of like um, wedge pressure were done with patients that routine, in, a, in a site that routinely used uh, swan GAN. So I think mm. some of those things are pneumothorax. I think harder to, um, it seems more objective rather than mm -hmm. this looks like consolidation versus atelectus versus, mm -hmm. uh, you know, even our CT scans <clears throat> don't, uh, don't have that level of uh, we'll get these mixed reports. Mm -hmm. So th there is still some more gray area, I think, for more for consolidation. Um, but filling pressure pneumothorax is probably the strongest because they've been validated more in Like they just used the reports with someone that was not connected it, to the scan. My, my, my opinion is you'd be guess best to prove the really good objective ones and convince everyone that it's worth doing because the objective ones work. And then the other ones, it's not to say don't do it. I mean, you think of a lot of things we do in medicine. You get a number of investigations, sometimes two or three consultants, and then you come to a consensus yeah. with not certainty, but the best bet, this is probably such and such a diagnosis. So this is adding to the conversation about you know, improving your diagnosis. And then there'll be another category, like you said, that maybe the pneumothorax, uh, you, you can eventually say, well, we're really comfortable putting a chest tube in someone now without an x-ray because we know the ultrasound is, is that good. Yeah, definitely do categories. <clears throat> and I think partly when I was reading through it, it's very good that they've studied this with some sometimes gold standards, sometimes mm. less soft things because I think it is a big time investment. I think one of the other things is it actually just gets the people in the room, like the time someone's ultrasounding, when you're looking at everything else that's going on with the patient, you can probably tell a lot more than yeah. the baseline amount of time that you may spend in the room. Like it just draws people in, or maybe it draws in people that are more attuned to that anyway. So there's probably some other variables related to the, like the uh, parallel ICU study of using this ICU. They probably had some pre-existing things that... See, you're too young, but I can remember the era when we used Bayesian statistics and having a priori probabilities was a huge breakthrough in thinking when you ordered things like lung scans. Well, this is exactly the yeah. same. That but that's come back You're probably going to have a better, uh, a better approach to this using other information, having a priori hypotheses, and, and then looking at the objective test and how does that help in a Bayesian statistical approach. But really interesting stuff. But that's come back now. Uh, you know, this Bayesian analysis of, like, the OLE trial or even the one about lactate reanalyzing trials with your pre and post. So there's a cycle. That parallel ICU one, yeah. were, did they have similar lengths of stay? I mean, you some yeah. differences, but it, it didn't say that beforehand they were entirely similar and afterwards. You know yeah, it, <coughs> they just reported it as a delta versus, like they were kind of um, same health authority, but they just showed a delta between the two. Um, they, yeah. I see that point. I think uh, I think they were the same. They weren't the same before having, yeah, yeah. having a different yeah. <laughs> I think they reported the same same baseline, but I didn't see yeah. Yeah. How often do you use the ultrasound to test your own diagnostic um, technique before implementing other than for fluid, before implementing some strategy like putting a chest tube in or doing some something else without using other diagnostic so I think for <clears throat> like for lungs, it's mainly related to fluid draining a pleural effusion if it looks complex. I think that's fair to do without you don't need an X-ray. But often, by the time I see someone, they've had an X-ray. But I think the other thing that's relatively helpful is you know for at MSJ the ultrasounds there. Very quickly you can tell what the person's diagnosis is, what tests you need to do more urgently in treatment. So I think um, the big parts of it are. Um, fluid, antibiotics, um, getting into the next diagnosis. 
chest tube probably for fluid. Uh, pneumothorax, less so, again, because by the time they've come to us, they've, they've probably had an x-ray. Um, um, Foley stuff, like I think it's, it's variable, but it may limit my next, next test, like transporting them. When you're talking about limiting the next test, <clears throat> I guess I'm just thinking like farther down the road, like if I'm on CTU and this patient comes out of ICU, or out of, even in the immersion, sometimes they'll do bedside ultrasound and they'll say, I saw this, and then we're kind of picking it up and trying yeah. to figure out the next step, but we have no real, like we don't have the image, we don't have, we just have a one line in the chart that says yeah. this is what was seen. So sometimes when our differential changes, as things change, it's very difficult for us to go back and ask another, like sometimes if we have CT scans, we'll go back to radiology and say, hey, this is now our question, is could this be a possibility, which I think is limited when you're answering a specific question, I think appropriately in critical care. But I just wonder yeah. in the future with documentation, like around focus and, and the longer term, um, trying to make decisions farther down the road. How yeah, do you do I, I guess try to be mindful if it's going to be if you can change the person's therapy. Like I've had, you know, to say this person has transient LV dysfunction in the ICU, and then we start putting them on LV enhancement therapy, and then, you know, they're getting better, and I say, we should do an echo probably in a month or two to see if this has gotten better. But we actually can look right now, and you see that it's gone back to totally normal. For that person, I'll say, we should, in the ICU, we might have done two that show dysfunction back to normal. We should do a repeat one, to, like a formal one, to say that it's normal. They don't need LV. If it's going to change their therapy, um, uh, then it should be repeated. You know, maybe there's a role of once we've done this, maybe um, there could be an echo person to say, we agree this is normal, limit the test. But I think if it's going to change their long-term therapy, it should be more in the realm of like a documented, um, like outside of focus. So you don't want to make more work and repeat tests. And I think the big thing is it's more the reassessments that are, that are helpful a one-time test of how things look is, is less helpful. But if I'm taking fluid off on CRT and you see, you know, this, they're starting to collapse, or we looked at someone's, we even looked at someone's transthoracic echo that they had two days ago, their IVC is totally collapsing, you know, and their lungs are dry, we're not going to give them fluid. So I think just looking, being able to now look at the tests that are done is, is helpful. Do you think, uh, kind of, it's good talk up. Do you think, to a certain extent, I kind of feel like in 10 years' time, like all the residents or all the people who are doing any kind of in-hospital work will be walking around with an ultrasound? And doing it, obviously, there's going to be challenges in terms of training and making sure people are comfortable with it and documentation of those things. But is that sort of how you see it going? Like, it seems like it's so useful and there's no real, other than making wrong diagnosis, <laughs> a huge downside, you know, in terms of, like, you know, doing dangerous things for the patients. But... I don't know, is that how you see this in 10 years' time? It's going to be like a stethoscope where people just walk around with iPhone and it's just attached to an ultrasound or whatever when the technology gets I better. think there's definitely a big push for that. You know, I feel, I guess, a little bit old when I'm like, you have to examine the person first, look at their vitals, look at their cap, decide all those things, and then add on with this. The biggest thing is when people go in and start with the ultrasound. I think that's probably not, should not be the, the prime thing, like talking to them, exa examining them. But I, I think there's going to be... This is, this is unstoppable, um, partly because of the lure of technology, but that's why I was, there's some studies going on, but we don't keep these going. If it's enough, oh, we've done these, we should just implement this, that could lead to more, more harm. How are we going to, like maybe AI, documentation, you need those things to be kind of ongoing. <clears throat> well, I think that's happening now. So there's, there's quite a lot of people telling you about a bedside ultrasound finding when all the basic questions that you would want to put that in context, the answer is, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, <laughs> right? And it, to me, that's pretty scary. Um, it's, the, it's the antithesis of, of what it's supposed to be, which is a tool that helps you uh, get quicker to the right definitive diagnostic test. But in terms of Adib's question, I mean, the, the scariest study I've seen lately is either uh, an extremely positive comment about the ability of ultrasound or an extremely negative comment about the competence of clinical cardiology at Cedar sinai But uh, they took two medical students with less yeah. than three days training and 
compared them to staff cardiologists for identification of pathology in a, you know, a sequential series of patients coming to an echo lab, and the medical students killed the staff. So, I think that's uh, the thing. Like, you know, you have these findings. Someone said, "I saw this," but how much would you trust if trainee or another staff? Someone told you this yeah. person has a very late peaking murmur, single S2. You know, I'm fairly sure this person has aortic stenosis. You probably you believe it, but you say, "Let's get the ultrasound to confirm it." So I think that's why I kind of look at it on the realm of past physical exam, but not diagnostic level, and if you don't use this right, then there'll be a bad outcome, and we've, they've seen that before, and now I think at the beginning of that paper, Christina's paper had you know, someone getting lysed for a PE that didn't have a PE. I mean... Well, you know, it's a big paradigm shift. You can imagine the day the stethoscope was invented and people said, you know, you can actually listen inside the human body. Well, here's a tool where you can actually see inside the human body, and we're in that as you say, between innovation and early adapter, but you can imagine in 20 or 25 years when you watch all these sci-fi films on TV and all the things they can do in the future that we laugh at now, but you know, 50 years ago they probably are amazed at what we can do now. So I can imagine a day when you actually might start with the ultrasound and run that in parallel with your antiquated physical exam because you can look in the patient while you're feeling the abdomen and listening to the heart sounds and listening to the chest, and then together thinking about what does that mean for a diagnosis. I think you definitely have to move with the time. But. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, like, you know, the clinical, the clinical skills course uh, in med school, I guess, would be the obvious place to, to teach this. In, in many ways, once the residents get, get out into the distributed sites, there will be no there, mm -hmm. there won't be reliable expertise at any right. given site, uh, and if you think about the whole course, well, you probably want a cardiologist teaching uh, how to interpret uh, the cardiac ultrasound mm -hmm. uh, component. Like for instance, they it, were left out of the design it was done by the radiologist, the bedside bedside yeah. ultrasound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We get a volunteer. <laughs> well, and so we'll put Chris oh, down doing, for uh, for but, now, but but you know, and then the longest anyone's game because nobody knows anything about it, you know, but, uh, and, and then, but, but, he, you know, I asked, like the last time I was in the service, the, one of the residents that I, you know, yeah. I, I, uh, and, and no offense to them, if they're there, I don't know, but uh, they sort of said, oh, I screened the, uh, the ureter and I, uh, there was no hydronephrosis or stones. I go, oh, really? So if you were this guy, like, are you, are you saying we don't need to call the radiologist and, yeah, I think those ones uh, still like, make you're in septic shock. Are you, are you confident? I'm going to write that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, no, you know, so, so, and I'm not. Uh, so, so, but if you get a baseline level of training, uh, probably has to be med school. I think it's the cats of the bag. By the time you go up to uh, Prince George to or Manthe Joe's underserviced areas, say, wherever they be, uh, or, or BGH or St. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same yeah. variability. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At the and I think it, people yeah. will become more receptive. Like I think yeah. when I was, you know, in ICU training, like I went down to the ultrasound department and I said I want to learn how to scan abdomens, and they said, why? <laughs> and, uh, but they're open to it. They, you go with the text and, and scan and keep yeah. doing it, but it's not very, <clears throat> even like eight, ten years ago when a non-cardiology person came to our echo lab saying, I want to learn, I said, well, then do cardiology. <laughs> but well, I think other, we have to change. Like, and the, I other, think, the other parallel, there was a day when you could walk into a room and just say you were a cardiologist, and then they thought, well, probably we need accreditation training programs and certification. You and the, can on the North Shore. Yeah, well, you know, there are examples all over the world, but, you know, it's, it's a it change, change compared to 50 years ago. And I would imagine, the question I was kind of going to ask in the last minute was exactly that. What are kind of the accreditation, certification, and medical litigation issues of, of letting this kind of get out on its own momentum, uh, and then, you know, it only takes one or two bad cases that, to kill a whole process because it wasn't managed well, and, you know, it's, it is probably at the med school level and at the training program for the residencies. I'm Not to answer it, just, you know, food for thought, that if it gets too far ahead of itself, then exactly. mistakes will kill it. Yeah, it's like tempered enthusiasm, but I think there's, there is some document, uh, accreditation you can do, but you can see you look at when these things were established, who's reviewing these scans, um, it is put together relatively recently, and I think 
you know, SCCM has made their own course where you have to go for a couple of days, but a lot of this is hands-on. Like, I think the level of needing 300 transthoracic echoes to get signed off to be, or 450 to do it, it's not to that level. And if you look at the different societies, like there's C-POCUS, there's SCCM, there's Emerge has one, and I think everyone's trying to figure this out, but there are, are cases where there's misdiagnosis. And yeah, Ken, um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if maybe the really key component that we should focus on is what the question is. Mm. Um, so, you know, if you're <clears throat> not a skilled ultrasonographer, maybe you should figure out which five questions you can accurately ask and answer with the device and get really good at those uh, five questions. So it, in my view, should all be built around clinical questions that you ask and answer and you do it accurately. Yeah. See, ultrasound will give you fantastic pictures. There are so many cool things in there, but it wouldn't be me who would get those pictures and it wouldn't be me who should interpret those really cool, interesting findings. That should be, you know, professionals. Um, but I should get good at asking and answering questions. And I, I worry that people learn to get pretty pictures and go, oh gosh, that's cool. That's not what this is about. Mm -hmm. It's about trying to answer a question and help your patient out. And when you see something that's beyond your skill level, good God, get an appropriate <laughs> comprehensive echo exam or ultrasound exam instead of trying to pretend that you're, you know, you're really good because you got a cool picture. Can I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I think it's exactly the same watch inexperienced people go and flap, bang, 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 and you do 35 things, none of them particularly well, because you're fulfilling a need to fill out a form as opposed to answering a question. And compared to the first point, I want to know if there's much of a neuron on the left side and listening carefully for a long time, and that's it. You know, you don't go feel the fetal pulses and whatever it is. I have the same observation looking at what people are doing with the stuff. It's taking a picture of everything that looks kind of like a good overview as opposed to the really well done. You've nailed uh, the volume of stuff. Or whatever. I think the big thing is <clears throat> in a learning environment and people expand. You do what you're, the question and then whether the rest is for learning or practice rather than used for this point of care ultrasound. The line is, is blurred, and that's what we, that I, I usually try to clarify. We're doing this for learning, but we're not doing this because we have a question that this person has a stone. I'm not making for them. We're pretty small, you know. But I'm getting in there all the time. Yeah, I'm not making for them.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, 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 I
litigation so, because so many patients right? are so sick, so many of them are going to die of their disease. So if you make a mistake, uh, partly even if you did go to court, it wouldn't be the, you have to prove that you made the difference. Where, and what do you guys think? Are you guys in ICU? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, uh, 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 I know my dog, but you've been around a long time. What do you think? You the highest, the highest, the highest the risk for you being sued. Uh, yeah, what name, name the type of case? I have a scenario of you. It's not actually which attending position. And, and, and you think this is where you're and you lose. You will lose at, at, at 99, 99%. I, I sat in on a case as a an expert on one, and it was, as I said, a friend of mine said it wasn't a fair fight. The doctor went down the in the first round. Anyone know? I was saying, don't I No. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah
Yeah, well, this, well, this is good. I mean, anyway, it's kind of like, yeah, it should be all done. And then bring up the address. You don't have to have a contract. Don't worry. Well, they don't do this all. They don't want to be working with the team. Yeah, it's going to be the clinicians. Because that, you can imagine, again, like that sci fi movie image in 20 years in the future. Uh, you know, it will be every, every doctor tomorrow. It would be like saying, stethoscope. Oh my God, no, not everyone needs a stethoscope. But at the time, that was probably part of, yeah, who would be able to use a stethoscope? Who would be able to use a machine where you look in the body? If a doctor didn't do that, they'd be like, yeah, wow, let me show. What are you from the year 2019? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I mean, it's, it's, it's problematic. Great, great guys like Barry, but like his senior resident, and then training for us. And yeah, yeah. Well, I've, I've identified our uh, significant <laughs> character of the season. Yeah. Like, how is he going to sign off? Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. The ICU guys can try to figure out what are the things where if you make a mistake, it's big time fun. I mean, it's a little bit about Alexis. Who reads? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. still not the number of reads. Yeah. <laughs> but if you miss pericardial fusion or call pericardial fusion, miss one or call anyone, you know, there are a few things. Yeah. Like, I mean, well, I, I think the damage, the hydrosis, all those things. Yeah, that, that's a great the example. Yeah, that's a big thing. You know, like, or call it hot, like, yeah. like yeah. weed. Yeah. Yeah. I got caught on one, and only a few that I know of, where I screwed up. Four in the morning, septic shock, going down the tubes. Got a big, this is 30 years ago, got a big fight with radiology. You know, can you come in and do an ultrasound and worry about, uh, you know, renal obstruction and sepsis from a renal source? And no, oh, no, we can't come down. I thought, okay. All right, well, first thing, 8 o'clock in the morning. Problem with that decision was the patient died at 7 o'clock. I'm going like yeah. Why the hell wasn't I more advocating for that patient? You know, yeah. it's a well-known cause of refractory septic shock getting worse despite everything you know we were doing in the best ability. And you know, I just didn't push hard enough for the radiology. So yeah. it's the same with these uh, ultrasounds. One day it'll be me you know, ultrasound yeah, as a bedside doctor. Mm -hmm. You can imagine in ten years you'd be culpable for not doing it. bedside in ICU or emergency. I guess at the clinical skills, but you'd have to, you'd 